Maria Timofeyevna's room was twice the size of the one occupied by the captain and furnished with the same crude furniture, but the table in front of the sofa was covered with a bright, festive tablecloth. A lamp was burning on it. A beautiful carpet was spread over the whole floor. The bed was set apart behind a green curtain that ran the whole length of the room. And there was, besides, one big soft armchair by the table in which, however, Maria Timofeyevna never sat. In the corner, as in her former lodgings, there was an icon with an icon lamp burning in front of it. And on the table, the same indispensable little things were laid out. The deck of cards, the little mirror, the songbook, even the sweet roll. In addition to which, there had also appeared two books with colored pictures. One of extracts from popular travel writings adapted for young readers. The other, a collection of light didactic tales, mostly about knights, intended for Christmases and boarding schools. There was also an album of various photographs. Maria Timofeyevna was, of course, expecting her visitor, as the captain had said, but when Nikolai Zedlitovich entered her room, she was asleep, half reclining on the sofa, leaning on an embroidered pillow. The visitor closed the door inaudibly behind him and, without moving from the spot, began to study the sleeping woman. The captain had stretched things a bit when he said that she had seen to her toilet. She was wearing the same dark dress as on Sunday at Varvara Petrovna's. Her hair was done up in the same way in a tiny knot at the nape. Her long and dry neck was bared in the same way. The black shawl given her by, by Varvara Petrovna lay on the sofa, carefully folded. As usual, she was crudely made up with white and rouge. Nikolai Zavlitovich had not been standing there even a minute when she suddenly awoke as if she had felt his gaze on her, opened her eyes and quickly sat up straight. But something strange must also have happened with the visitor. He went on standing in the same spot by the door with a fixed and piercing look. He stared silently and persistently into her face. Perhaps this look was excessively stern. Perhaps it expressed loathing, even a malicious delight in her fear. Unless the half-awake Maria Timofeyevna was simply imagining it. But suddenly, after almost a minute-long pause, the poor woman's face took on an expression of complete horror. Spasms ran across it. She raised her hands, shaking them, and suddenly began to cry, exactly like a frightened child. Another moment, and she would have screamed, but the visitor came to his senses. In an instant, his face changed, and he approached the table with a most amiable and tender smile. I'm sorry I frightened you, Maria Timofeyevna, by coming in unexpectedly while you were asleep, he said, giving her his hand. The sound of these tender words produced its effect. Her fright vanished though she still looked at him with fear, apparently trying to understand something. Fearfully, she also gave him, her, gave him her hand. At last, a smile stirred timidly on her lips. Greetings, Prince, she whispered, peering at him somehow strangely. You must have been having a bad dream. He went on smiling with ever more amiability and tenderness. And how did you know I was dreaming about that? And she suddenly trembled again and recoiled, raising her hand in front of her as if to protect herself and preparing to cry again. Pull yourself together enough. There's nothing to fear. Didn't you recognize me? Nikolai Zevlitovich tried to persuade her, but this time it took him some while to persuade her. She looked at him silently with the same tormenting bewilderment, with a heavy thought in her poor head, still straining to think her way through to something. She would drop her eyes, then suddenly look him over with a quick embracing glance. Finally, she seemed not so much to calm down as to reach a decision. Sit here next to me, I beg you, so that I can have a good look at you afterwards, she said quite firmly, with some new and obvious purpose. And don't worry now, I won't look at you. I'll look down. And don't you look at me either until I myself ask you to. Do sit, she added even impatiently. A new sensation seemed to be taking more and more possession of her. Nikolai Evzevoletovich sat down and waited. There was quite a long silence. Hmm, it seems all strange to me, she muttered suddenly, almost in disgust. I am full of bad dreams, of course. Only why should you come into my dreams in such a way? Well, let's leave dreams out of it, he said impatiently, turning to her despite her prohibition. And perhaps the former expression flashed in his eyes again. He saw that several times she would have liked and liked very much to glance at him, but that she stubbornly resisted and looked down. Listen, Prince, she, she raised her voice suddenly. Listen, Prince, 
Why did you turn away? Why don't you look at me? What is this comedy about? He cried, unable to help himself. But it was as if she had not heard him at all. Listen, Prince, she repeated for the third time in a firm voice with an unpleasant, preoccupied look on her face. When you told me in the carriage then that the marriage would be announced, I felt afraid right then that the secret would be over. Now I really don't know. I kept thinking, and I see clearly that I'm not fit at all. I could dress up. I could receive people, too, perhaps. It's not so hard to invite people for a cup of tea, especially if there are servants. But still, how will they look at it from outside? I noticed a lot in that, that house then, that Sunday morning. That pretty young lady watched me all the time, especially when you came in. It was you who came in then, eh? Her mother's just a funny little old society lady. My Labyakin also distinguished himself so as not to burst out laughing. I had to keep looking up at the ceiling. The ceiling there is nicely decorated. His mother ought to be the superior of a convent. I'm afraid of her, though she gave me her black shawl. It must be they all attested, they all attested me then from an unexpected side. I'm not angry, only I was sitting there then and thinking, what kind of relation am I to them? Of course, what's required of a countess is only qualities of soul, because for housekeeping she has lots of servants, and some bit of worldly coquetry besides, so as to be able to receive foreign travelers. But still, that Sunday they looked at me hopelessly, only Dash is an angel. I'm very afraid they may upset him with some imprudent comment on my account. I'm going to switch back to the other translation, because what was it that pissed me off about this one? It must be they all attested me then from an unexpected side. They all attested me. Listen, Prince, she repeated it again in a firm voice. an unpleasantly fussy expression on her face. When you told me in the carriage on Sunday that our marriage would be publicly announced, I was afraid it would be the end of our secret. Since then, I've been thinking about it all the time, and I see now that I won't be up to it. I suppose I could manage to dress decently and be a possible hostess, for it's really no great feat to have people for tea, especially if you have servants. But still, how would it look to others? That Sunday, I noticed a lot in that house. There was that pretty young lady who kept looking at me, especially after you came in. For it was you who came then, wasn't it? Her mother is nothing but a ridiculous little old society lady, and my Lebyetkin, he also gave quite a performance. I only stopped myself from laughing by looking at the ceiling. There are beautiful patterns on that ceiling over there. His mother should be a mother superior, although she gave me this shawl. I'm still afraid of her. I'm sure all those people got a strange impression of me, and I don't blame them. How could they accept me as one of them? Of course, a countess needs only moral qualities. No need for her to be a good housewife with all the servants she has under her. And yes, she needs some sort of refined ways, too, to receive foreign travelers. Nevertheless, on that Sunday, they found me quite hopeless. Except for Dasha. She's an angel. But I'm terribly afraid that they might hurt his feelings by some careless remark about me. Don't be afraid and stop worrying, Stavroge said, his mouth twisting. But then I wouldn't mind too much, even if he was a bit ashamed of me, for there'll always be more pity than shame in him. He can judge each man for what he is, and he knows that they have more claim to pity than I do. It sounds as though you resent them a great deal, Maria. Who, me? No, she laughed frankly. I wasn't offended in the least. I looked at the lot of you and saw you were all angry at one another and quarreling, and I said to myself, there are people who get together and don't know how to have a good time and enjoy themselves. So much wealth and so little happiness. I found it all very shocking. But now I don't think I'm sorry for anyone but myself. I understand you have had a bad time with your brother when I'm not here. Who told you that? Nonsense. It's much worse now. I have horrible dreams now, and they're horrible because you've arrived. Anyway, I would like to know why you have come. Will you kindly tell me? Tell me, would you like to go back to the convent? I had a feeling they'd offer to let me go back to the convent. There's nothing so wonderful about that convent of yours, you know. Why should I go back there now? What would I take there? I'm all alone now, and it's too late for me to begin a third life. You seem to be very angry about something. Perhaps you're afraid I don't love you anymore? 
You're the least of my worries. What worries me is that I myself may fall very much out of love with someone. She laughed scornfully. I must have displeased him extraordinarily, she suddenly added, as if talking to herself. Only I can't think what I did wrong, and that will haunt me as long as I live. I've lived for five full years afraid that I was guilty of something before him. I've prayed and prayed and kept thinking of my great guilt before him. And then it turned out that it was true. That what was true. I'm afraid that perhaps there's something on his part, she went on, either not hearing or ignoring his question. Again, how could he get involved with such a third-rate crowd? The Countess would have gladly torn me to pieces, although she did invite me to ride next to her in her carriage. They're all against me. Is it possible that he is too? Is it possible he has betrayed me? Her lips and chin began to tremble. Listen, have you read about Grishka, Otrepiev, the pretender, the false czar, whom they anathematized in seven cathedrals? Stavrogin didn't answer. 